here we are. This is our engine room. And here we are. Yes, no mistaking, this is the engine room. It smells different. It sounds different. It even feels different. It's a little bit warmer than, I, not as warm as I expected, actually. I thought it'd be very hot down here, but it is certainly warmer. And I've been told that we are going to meet Simon, who helped us out in the winch room. And I think he's going to be down here for us to show us around. Yes, Simon. Oh, hello again. Hi. Good to see you. How are you? Thank you. You found, uh, you found, we found us. You. We yeah. found you. So, we're in the engine room. Well, you're actually in one of two engine rooms on the ship. Two. We have two engines in this side. And to make us nice and safe, we have another engine room which is separate, which has two engines in on the other side. Okay, so is that in case one has a failure or yeah, for extra or speed? Yeah, or potentially or, or flood. Yeah. Okay. But we, we are more like a power station where we have two, di two diesel in each engine room, one nine cylinder, which is the low one behind you. Okay. And that goes all the way down that hole there. And the small one is the one behind me, is the six cylinder. Right, and then that's mirrored on the other side mirrored as well. Mirrored exactly on the other okay. side. And what they do is generate electricity. And we generate about 18 megawatts if we, if we, if we need to. Obviously, we just generate what we need yeah. to, be, to be as fuel efficient as possible. Yeah, yeah. And 18 megawatts, that's about, about 210 family cars. Wow. So, yeah. So we generate the electricity here. All the services thing, come, come to the engines and do that. The generators are just these big boxes to the side here. And then we take the electricity further down the ship to power us away. Wow, amazing. So uh, do you ever use both engine rooms at the same time? Yes, yeah, so particularly if we're going to be, when we're working ice, we right. need all the power we can. Right, to generate more power to crush through the ice. Yeah. Fascinating. So. It's not as, it's not as um, warm as I thought it would be. Is that because this one's not running? I, I guess the other side is... And also, it's, it's October outside, and we're bringing fresh air in to keep us cool. So actually, we're bringing the outside air in, and that's quite a, got a bit of a nip to it today. Yeah, because my question was going to be really about conditions down here. I think I expected it to be like you see on, on films where everyone's really hot and sweaty and covered in oil and grime, and this is like really clean. It's really... Ambient temperature. It's yes, a, it's not what but I when the, the engines run, and you'll feel that when we walk through next door to the switchboard rooms, right. the temperature goes goes up. And right. in the tropics, yes, this will be very very warm. Because obviously you're bringing blowing air in there, which is nice and cool today at probably what 10, 15 degrees. In the tropics, your cooling air is coming in at 35 degrees. Of course, of course. And how many people will be working down here in the engine room with you? We operate a couple of times. Obviously, it's not my usual place, but as we met before, the chief yeah. engineer asked me to bring you down here. Great. There's, a, there's normally a chief engineer who's over all the engineering on the ship, second engineer who's in charge of the engine room, right. and, and, she, and she looks after that. And then below her, she's got third engineers and fourth engineers, about two thirds and a fourth, and then obviously electrical two, two electrical officers as well. Amazing. Just to run all this. And there's further machinery rooms forward just to provide all the services to the vessel. Wow. Now, Simon, you've obviously been an integral part of, the, of this, this whole vessel. Have you, were you involved right from the start? Yes, I was lucky enough to be brought in one of three people to go into the shipyard very, very early on. Well, we had a chief engineer, a ca captain, I think Will you met earlier. Yes, yes. He was the, one of the captains, well, he was, a, he was re recruited to be a captain. And then uh, I was brought in, majority of the science side, but because I'm a ship's engineer by training, I guess you're involved with everything. So you were involved with where all of this was going to live and how it was all going to well, function? Yeah, well, the designers, obviously the designers Amazing. Shoreside, they have a, have a remit to, we've designed a, a, a schedule of what they have to do and then they've put it all together. Wonderful. So I'm standing between an engine, another engine, two generators, and we've got all of that next door as well. And this all just sends that power through to the props which just turns the, yeah. turns the boat over and off yeah. we go. Wonderful, it sounds so simple. <laughs> right, should we carry on, have a little look around? Yes. yes, there's a million meters of cable in the ship making it all go. A million meters of cable? Yes. Wow, that's amazing. Well, as I was just saying, the electricity is generated by the engines and then comes to these panels here, and this is what governs and controls everything. And then from here, it goes through the ship to the propellers and the the promoters that drive the propellers around. Great. Wow. And as we've come into here, this is the propulsion motor room. So 
So these big blue boxes here are the electric motors that drive the propeller shaft. Wow. You see them joined in the middle? Yeah. So there's two in this room, and like the engine room, there is two next door. Okay. Because we have two propellers that's independently, so they're all separated out. Right. And is this built for speed or torque or power? What, what's the design being behind it? Obviously, a fuel efficiency is the, is the primary thing to make the best use of the vessel. But obviously, at the end of the day, we need power to get to ice when we need to do it. Yeah, so the, the, whole, the whole form and everything else was tank tested in a, a tank for model ice to work out how much power it was going through that would take to force its way through the ice. Because it's a bit different to previous vessels, isn't it? Its draft is, uh, isn't as deep. Is that right? It's a different... Quite, quite often for, for icebreakers, you put that much weight and power into them, they're quite deep. But where some of the places we go are relatively shallow. We're only about seven, just over seven metres. Right. And we need to be work on that. So there is a compromise in the whole form and making everything light and still being able to do every job we did. So not really built for zooming across the oceans, but no. certainly having the power when you hit a huge amount of ice to smash up. It certainly is, because when, when you hit the ice, obviously if you had a very sharp bow like warships or cruise ships, basically it's like an ax. Yeah. You hammer it into a piece of wood, it gets stuck. This one's got quite a rounded bow with the aim that it rides up. And then I talk a bit like a spoon. You push the spoon down and use the weight of the, the surface area of the spoon and that just pushes the ice to the sides. Right. That's a new idea as well, isn't it? It's, it's the, previously it's been about cutting through, but this is about sort of squashing down. Is that right? Since we've gone, gone, gone to working with them, Amundsen, very, some of the ships were very round, rounded holes, even back to Amundsen's time. But obviously we're taking it to the next, to the next stage. But all ice strengthened ships tend to have that sort of rounded form then. And I forget the gentleman, there was a, I think it was a Dutchman right. or, or a European who worked out trying to make tugs in a harbour in, over there, which iced up every winter. And therefore he generated this idea of using a rounded form to. And how thick, how thick will some of the ice be that this has to power through? Well, the aim is we'll go th three knots or just over three miles an hour through a metre of ice, of, new, right. of first year ice. So it's the softer stuff, the newly formed, but we can, well, what's that? push it out of the way but also it helps if it's, it's not very tightly packed because yeah. sometimes you can be a hundred miles into the ice and the wind through weather changes and pushes you it pushes it and makes it much harder to go to go through there's no chance of the uh, the vessel getting trapped in the ice and frozen up is there i know that's happened in the past maybe. well hopefully yeah I, I was on a previous ship and we were temporarily because the weather's changed it nicked us and you get to the point where you're inside in the middle of the, off the tens of miles off the coast so you're in no danger but it's just easier to wait for the weather to change the ice to release because you just don't end up burning more fuel yeah, yeah. getting to it just bashing your way through not necessarily going very far very fast well having seen this uh, this lovely ship that we're aboard i think there's worse places to be trapped <laughs> so um listen simon thanks once again for your time so what we've seen here today is that all of that power that we've seen generated in there comes through the control room, is driven through here, and then beyond there, we hit the props and the propeller drives the boat. That's the one. Wonderful. Great. We'll make our way back out. Thanks so much. You're welcome.